All right. So welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Today I have Bill Westrom. He is a, an entrepreneur and you are an author. Are you a co-author on that book or did I just want to make sure that I... Yeah, I'm the co-author of okay. Master Your Debt. So you're, you're still an author. <laughs> yeah. So Bill is a co-author of a book um, entitled Master Your Debt. And he is the entrepreneur of a business. Um, it's called Credit Line Bank, right? And we're going to talk to him today because he is a financial expert with 25 years of experience, and he's going to help us out. He's going to tell us how to bank and borrow better. So welcome, Bill. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, Nicole, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So street level consumer finance expert, what does street level mean? Right at the lobby level. You know, if you, if you look at the bank, right, all the banking takes place on the 35th floor down to the 30th floor, mm -hmm. right? At the lobby level, dealing with the consumer and everybody's problems, that's where I've been residing for 25 years, just helping people out and doing the best that I can with the tools available. Nice. So when did you know that you were good with finances? Um, that's a really good question. I guess um, I didn't know I was good with finances until I got into the financing world. But I've always been... Uh... Oh, sorry about that. That's okay. Life happens. Well. Yeah. I could have been prevented. Sorry. <laughs> um, it won't happen again. Um, anyway, um, I didn't know I was good at finances until I got into financing, but I've always been really good with the numbers. You know, math is my thing. And, and okay. I was born with an engineering kind of mind, you know, just understanding how things work. And when you combine that with math, everything's tied to math, everything. Now, would you say um, growing up you were money conscious or did you just like not really pay attention to money much until you got a little bit older? Um, I paid attention to money because I started earning money when I was 11. Wow. I was conscious of money because I watched my stepfather start with nothing and create himself an incredible business. If you remember the Farrah Fawcett poster of the 70s. Mm hmm his printing company printed all those posters. Wow, that's pretty and, amazing. Yeah, so uh, so again, I was conscious of what money brought. I mean, I had a great childhood, lots of fun, but I had to start working at 11. And uh, so I was conscious of money, but I didn't get into money until much later in life, you know, because okay. I was born and raised in that era where, I mean, my parents never, ever talked to me about money. Mm -hmm. never talked to me about how they paid their bills what it cost to live nothing yeah so I relied on you know the little bit of education we all got in high school which is virtually none and then just like everybody else your foot hits the curb and you just people start telling you what to do right put your money so in a checking account get low rates and low payments you know we're just told <laughs> what to do yeah, that's so true. Um, nowadays, thank God they have courses. Um, my daughter took a course at a camp where they, um, it was called piggy bank and they taught them about um, buying a home, um, paying like daycare and expenses and all these bills and making decisions. And she's only, she was 10 at the time. So she was just like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize how expensive things were. So Thank God that now, you know, people are more conscious of teaching the younger people about finances. So what I want to ask you, um, how did you before? No. Yeah. How did you get into this field? Like, what was the thing that took you into finances? Uh, necessity, earn a living for okay. one thing. Um, I had been working in a print shop. A buddy and I owned a print shop in eastern Washington state. Uh, and we ended up having to shut that down. And I'm like, well, I need something to do. I'm good with numbers. Uh, what, where's some longevity? That's what I was really looking for. And uh, mortgage broker. Everybody's going to be owning and buying homes. That, that's a business that's not going away. So that's what I jumped into. Wow. So you did that first and then you love that or you just maybe that was your entryway. Like, tell me what happened after you got into being a mortgage broker. Did you stay in that field? Cause it seems like you probably do more than just that, but. Well, I, I've done a lot more, but since I got into the mortgage business, I pretty much stayed there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Yeah, I really enjoyed it from the standpoint of working with people. I love working with people. Obviously, it's a numbers thing. And, you know, it's a puzzle, right? How things work. Because when you're putting together a mortgage, all it is a matter of puzzle pieces, yeah. right? All those puzzle pieces have to fit together for the loan to close for me to get paid. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it. But uh, I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preempt later in your show. I'm going to give you an early, oh, hell, no moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I know you usually wait for them. The end yeah, of the <laughs> but and when it re, you know relating to what I do today, uh, I was a mortgage broker, and this guy walked into my office from an Australian bank, and wanted me to sell this special loan that they had brought over, and it was a first lien HELOC home equity line of credit, mm -hmm. and which is, just means it's a big, big um, line of credit. You know, instead of a regular conventional first, it's just like a massive revolving line of credit. And he explained how you put your money in and money out. And this is what happens. And just my engineering brain and the numbers within 15 minutes, Nicole, I literally said, oh my God, you've got to be shiting me. Where has wow. this been all our lives? Because it just clicked in my head. And that's when, I mean, it bit me. It bit me hard. And it's all I've done for the last, since 2002. Yeah. Then, I'm going to ask you about that. That's further down. So, um, all right. So you've been working in that industry. So tell me, what is the biggest financial mistake you have made to date? Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. There are several. <laughs> um, <laughs> the biggest financial mistake I, I've made is not making a financial uh, move that, put it this way, years ago, when I was 18 years old, my father recommended I get myself a life insurance policy, a whole life policy that would build in value, right? He tells me this at 18. Well, at 18, you know, I'm healthy. I'm like, life insurance, what are you talking about? And he never sat down and really explained why I should consider it, right? But I'm telling you what, if I did take that advice and I would have understood what I was doing, oh, I'd, be, I'd be a rich man by now. So that's the biggest mistake I made was not doing something that I should have. Right. All right. So um, what do you think is the biggest trend that you see with people and financial issues? Um, it's a non-ending treadmill. Because if you think about, we are all carbon copies in regards to how we bank and borrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, your money goes into a checking account and it doesn't go into a boot in your closet. It goes into a checking account. And when you finance your life, you finance low rate, low payment, and everything fits within the paycheck. I mean, we're carbon copies. We all do the same thing. And that's really why I'm trying to get on air and talking to people about this is because that model by which we bank and borrow, that is our problem. That is what's causing most of the financial distress for 95% of the population is that we, we don't look at our income as a unique asset because it is an asset right? Just like your 401k. If you put money into a 401k, is that your money? Yes, it is. Is it an asset? Yes, it is, right? Not because it's sitting on the asset side of the ledger, because you're putting it to work, earning interest with that money, right? Right. Now, when you look at our, when that money hits the paycheck, do you look at your check, your paycheck as an asset? Or is it just a pile of beans that you're going to go dip into to pay your mortgage and your rent and your gas and your groceries. I mean, do we look at it as an asset when it's sitting in that checking account? And that would be a big fat no. Right. Right. And then when we look and then we got the debt side of the ledger. Well, the whole debt side of the ledger, when you look at interest and rates and all that, all that is is a siphon off our checking account, off our income, of course, with payments and all that. So we've got these, the debt side that's, siphoning money off of us. We've got our checking account that does nothing. But the thing about our checking account, somebody is turning it into an asset and that's the bank. Because they're taking our income, taking it over to the asset side of the ledger and they're earning interest off our income, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't get any of that interest back. It's our, it's our asset, but we don't treat it like an asset once it hits that bank, right? So. To answer your question, you can see the trend. You know, when you ask me about the trend, well, the trend is pretty easy to follow. 
because it's been going on since the 50s. <laughs> and everybody's doing the same thing, but nobody's getting any anywhere farther along the line. And it's not because they don't earn enough. It's not because they don't have an education. It's not because they're inept. It's just they've never had the education to really understand how the system works, who's making the money, how it's being made, and how we can apply it to our own lives. So the trend is going nowhere on the same treadmill, doing the same thing. Hmm. And if we want to change that, right? And again, carbon copies, your treadmill might look a little different than mine, but it's the same thing. So we've got to change the model by which we bank and borrow. So we're not continually trudging uphill, pulling the anchors along and, until we make it, you know? Right. Yeah. When do you make it? When do you make it? Right. <laughs> You're continually doing that same thing. You know, it's like insanity. Doing mm -hmm. the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Right. So um, in Master Your Debt, in chapter six, you talk about home equity line of credit. Tell us why you think this is a good idea and who should consider it and who shouldn't. Now, I read this and I was like, reading it to my husband, like, oh my gosh, like, never knew all of this. <laughs> yeah. So please tell us. Okay, well, the HELOC, right? The, the, you know, the book in, in most of what you see about this, the strategy itself is all based around HELOCs. Uh, but the line of credit is really what, what this thing is all about. A HELOC is only a line of credit secured by your home. You can have unsecured lines of credit. A credit card in your pocket is a line of credit. All right. But here's the magic to why the line of credit is the most incredible tool ever. The revolving door. That's it. That one component allows you to freely treat 100% of your income as a payment against debt without losing control of the money to go buy gas, groceries, and live your life day to day. Because if you look at a regular mortgage, if you gave your regular mortgage 100% of your paycheck, you have to apply for a cash out refinance to get eggs and groceries. That's why we don't do it. It's a crap trap. Money goes in, but it doesn't come back out. Well, with that line of credit, the door swings both ways. So that allows us to say, all right, we've got this debt in this line of credit that's charging us interest. And the higher the balance, the more interest we pay. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So if we had a $10,000 balance in the line of credit and we had five grand sitting in our checking account, if we took the five grand and put it into the line of credit, they have to treat it like a payment, dollar for dollar. So that takes your 10,000 down to 5,000. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So would you rather pay interest on 10,000 or 5,000? Five, please. You got it. So <laughs> that's why the line of credit is so great is because you can take this income and turn it into an asset by knocking that balance down so you're paying less interest. And when you do that, right? And basically we just cut the balance in half. Well, if we cut the balance in half, we cut your interest cost in half. Right, so twenty dollars in interest just went down to ten, or if you want to look at it a different way, we just cut the interest rate in half. Right, half mm -hmm. as much interest just because we moved our income into this line of credit, and of course because of the revolving door, we can go in and get what we need to live our lives and pay our bills. Right, so that's why I call it credit line banking. We bank out of a line of credit. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So yeah. who? Who would this not be good for? This would not be good for um, the fiscally irresponsible that really don't know the difference between wants and needs, you know, and continually get themselves in trouble. They just, you know, it's beyond, it's like for those that, those that shouldn't be driving a car shouldn't, same kind of people. <laughs> you know? uh, but again, to do it, I mean, you gotta be lendable. Right, you've got to have the capability to meet the bank guidelines to get a line of credit. Uh, you've got to have a stable income because it is your income that's flowing in and out and that's uh, making the whole thing work. And for the acceleration to take place, you've got to have what I call surplus, positive monthly cash flow. You've got to have, there's got to be something left over at the end of the month. 
because that's what's driving the, the acceleration process. Now, there are a lot of people that don't have a lot of money left over at the end of the month because of the way they've been financing their lives. You know, a couple of credit cards, a car, student loan, I mean, nothing crazy. It's just that when you start adding those debts that require payments, the payment's coming out of the income. And so that's where all the cash flow is going is to satisfy all the debt. Uh, with credit line banking, I mean, the whole premise is to take con back control of that debt. And so if you can bring that back into the line of credit, you can create cash flow for yourself by taking control of the debt and not having to send those payments out. So if you had $500 in debt payments that you could consolidate into your line of credit, well, you just improve your cash flow by 500 because that's no longer going out the door. Wow. So the only thing that scared me about this was the um, interest rate that changes. Very, very common because, uh, you know, those things can go, go mm -hmm. you know, I mean, 18% is the limit on a line of credit. Now, I'm not fearful that we're going to get there. When I started 15 years ago, the rate was eight and a quarter. And it's been, most of the time, it's been at three and a quarter since I've been doing this because of the economic situation. But mm. As I tell everybody that I, I work with, the rate doesn't cost you the money the balance does, mm. right? So that little example I used earlier, we cut the interest cost in half just by moving our income, i.e. we cut the interest in the same way. So again, if you can, uh, if you can manipulate the balance to manipulate the cost, then you really don't care what the rate is because you're balance driven because that's what's costing you the money, not the rate the balance. Got it. So that's how we can eliminate the fear of the interest rate. I mean, my customers are virtually interest rate immune. It doesn't matter what that interest rate does because they're banging away at the balance so much. Interest is going to be what it's going to be regardless of the rate. And away we go. Okay. All right. So I want you to give me um, your best tip for each of these topics and um, they'll be familiar to you. So um, relieving stress by ignoring your budget. Like you say here, forget traditional budgets. Everything you need to know is in your checking account, right? Okay. How can you give us a tip for about budgeting and stress relief? Well, first of all, identify your budget, right? Because a lot of people, they really don't know how to do that or traditional budgetary teachings, you know, they put a ceiling on it and you've got to, this is who you need to be, but life doesn't work that way. And people fail at budgeting every month because life, life doesn't work by a budget. So if you look at your checking account, your whole life flows in and out of that checking account, right? More than likely hundred percent of your income and hundred percent of your expenses. So what I tell people to do is go, total deposits and withdrawals out of your checking account for six months and then average it out. So if you total everything for six months, divide by six, that'll tell you your average expense number and your average income number. Now, when you look at that expense number, right? I mean, there's a zillion variables that come into play there. So I recommend going back through those statements and, and highlighting and taking out any real anomalies, any crazy stuff that you know, one-off stuff. You know, I needed, you know, 750 bucks for tires or a thousand dollars for a muffler, whatever. Take that stuff out and then start going through wants and needs because that's really where the budget is. We have wants and we have needs and the needs, you can't do away with the needs. Clothing, shelter, housing, utilities. I mean, the stuff that you're going to have no matter what. And then you've got the wants and that's, you know, the the going out and the playing around. And most people's budgets go awry when they don't know the difference between wants and needs. And I'm not saying budgetary, being a budget conscious and fiscally responsible doesn't mean you can't have any fun. It's just, just you just have to be, and I know you love this, self-aware. Yes. Self-awareness. You just, you just need to be self-aware of the resources you have to work with, the money you have to work with, how hard you work for it, and, and saying, okay, what, how can I get more and do better with this income? And part of it is saying, okay, what's waste? What can I do without that I really, that's, that, that's 
keeping me from where I want to go. So again, the, the number one tip is find your budget within your checking account because your whole life flows into it. Yeah, and, I like that. And that's really simple. It do, it's not so complicated. It's not like this big spreadsheet. Just go into your checking account and do this simple, um, this, um, yeah, test. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Just total things up because again, you know, it might not be a fun thing to do, but you know, money's, you know, dealing with finances isn't always fun. Yeah, it's scary. Uh, but you know, hey, exercise isn't any fun either. Oh God, I hate working out, but it's like a evil, a necessary evil. I, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, just same with money, same with like insurance, credit. Credit's a necessary evil. I mean, everybody talks about credit like it's some, you know, entity that's taking over our, you know, our lives. Well, no, it's a tool and our economy is done without it. So yeah. Think that credit is an evil villain and anybody that has credit is a fiscal moron no it's a tool and it's shoved down our throats and we can't we can't own a home we won't own a car we won't have an education without debt yep facts you know? so, so unless we just, you got a rich we uncle we just need to look at it as it is accept it and say okay i won't let it run my life because that's that's a big thing right there is that when people have debt and they have credit it runs their lives mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I say. The scary part, it's scary for people to look at their money because you have to face reality when you start looking at your money, you know? Yeah. Well, and, but the scary thing about money, about money with people is there's been no education, mm -hmm. right? So if somebody, you know, they think they've been doing all the right things. They got low rates and low payments. They didn't make any dumb moves. They thought they were doing proper, doing it properly. There's nothing left. I get this payment on the fifth and this one on the first. And I get this over here and I get that over there. And it's just, it's overwhelming. Yeah. And everybody feels subservient to it because of the due dates, because I've got a minimum payment. I've got it, you know, again, we're just, the, the banking and financial model we live within is controlling our lives and we don't even know it. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's why what I do, I'm so passionate about, and I'm dedicated my life to it from the moment I saw it, is because it take it cuts all the way all those shackles, right? It's the the one word I hear from my students is liberating. It's the most liberating experience they've ever had in their lives when they finally get control of their this debt and this money and it's doing something for them every day and they can go look and see and calculate yes it's working yes it's working and when you just when the walls of conventional practice fall away and you can actually spread your wings i mean i've had people just call me and say bill <laughs> i didn't know my life could be this way thank you wow that's you know, yeah you know i mean it's it gives me goosebumps yeah because when you really, it's like giving somebody a kidney. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Money is like you need it to live. So it, it's, you know, once you learn how to make your money work for you, I mean, it's an amazing thing. So give us a tip, marriage and money. Now, a lot of marriages end over money, right? So what is the one tip that you would give people about marriage and money? Make it a team game. That's the bottom line, because I've dealt with a lot of families that, you know, she makes her money, he makes his money, and they have a, a, a general account. He chips in his, he chips in hers, pays the bills, and everything else is their own money, right? But they've got the same mortgages, they've got the same car payments, they've got the same kids at college, they've got the same goals and dreams, but their money never comes together cohesively to accomplish everything. And the money together is a lot stronger together than it is apart. So if you, you know, and again, that's kind of an extreme, but there are a lot of families where she's the CFO and he doesn't pay attention to anything that's going on, or they're both trying to manage it collectively and she takes care of that. And it's, there's no cohesiveness, mm -hmm. right? So again, the, the main tip is come together as a team, bring that money together, have the same goals, have a target, you know, because there are a lot of families that don't even have a target. They're just, eh, you know, 
You know, we're just waiting for Timmy to get out of college and then we'll figure it out. It's too late by that point. You right. got to make it a team game. And even if in the past it's, it's you know, it's been a struggle, you know, because I know there was a lot of couples that just can't come together and it's always a fight. Um, if you love your wife, you love your husband and you love your marriage, then do what you got to do to make it a team game. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I'll give you examples of my students. I mean, I literally had a woman call me and said, you've saved my marriage. Because wow. for eight years of marriage, they could never sit down at the table and come to an agreement. It was always a fight. But once I got them into this program and everything's funneled into one single file line, we got one point to look at and shoot for, then they got nothing but to, to, but to come together. And right. That's awesome. Make it a team game. <clears throat> so tell us about your business and what services you offer. Um, all right. Credit line banking has been formally known as truth and equity. So I'm just going to let everybody know I'm rebranding truthandequity.com to credit line banking. And we're a coaching service, right? A coaching and support service because we don't sell loans. We're not in the, the banking business. We don't make any money off of loans. What we do is we bring people to the table. We do a very thorough analysis of their budget. And this comes down to those people that should not be doing it. We go through a very rigorous process to, to discover those that should and shouldn't. Because if you're going to work with credit line banking, you've got to get an invitation. And we go through a rigorous process to make sure your, your budget is worthy of, the, of the, the program. And then we'll help facilitate the loan process, right? So nobody's, nobody's ever on their own. Uh, we might not do the loan, but we can make sure that they're in the right bank, talking to the right people, getting the right product. Mm -hmm. Once the loan's in play, that's when our, the real service kicks in because that's when we got to take that conventional budget, right? What you earn, what you owe, and what you spend. All the creditors and vendors and merchants. I mean, some people have 50 to 100 transactions per month just living life. And we need to take all those transactions. We got to bring them into one single file line. So we have one bill pay a day and income goes into the line, bills get paid, and we'll monitor and track progress for six months. So there's monthly performance review meetings to make sure everybody's doing the right thing and you're getting the most out of the program. It's kind of like having a personal trainer, a financial personal trainer. Right. right? Make sure you're not blowing out a knee. And then, uh, you know, we've got a six month guarantee. So after six months of those performance review meetings, if the program's not working as prescribed, we give a full refund. But beyond the six months, that doesn't end the service. That just ends the guarantee period. So my service is a lifetime service. And so you pay me a one-time retainer. And I don't care if you need me 100 times a day or once every 100 years, you give me a call or any of us a call. Nice. I like it. So that's how it works. Well, you know, it's like anything else that's new, you know? Yeah. You need, you need some, some education, some coaching, some training, somebody looking over your shoulder and, you know. Yeah. We have golf coaches. <laughs> <laughs> we got coaches for everything. <laughs> yeah. So do you feel like you are doing purpose work by educating people about finances and helping them become better about their finances? It's my life's work, Nicole. When I've got, when I started with a couple that was just 30 years old in upstate New York and no kids. And two years later, they have, Two, they have two new kids. They had no kids at the time. They got two kids and they uh, own a four bedroom house on an acre and a half, totally debt free at 38 years old. Nice. I've got one of my first customers. He paid off exactly to the month I told him. He quit his crummy job the next week, sold his house seller financing, took a $25,000 check down payment received $1,600 a month and he picked up and moved to North Carolina from Virginia. So wow. when just teaching people how to get more out of their money to produce those kind of life-changing results, it's, it's yeah, worse, worse than heroin. It's worse than heroin. <laughs> you just don't get off this kind of stuff. But yeah, that's my passion. I, you know, 15 years dedicated service to this. I've done nothing else but this for 15 years. That's awesome because sometimes, I mean, it takes people sometimes forever to find something that they're truly passionate about and that they love. So that's amazing that you, you know, 
took a job and it just became your life's purpose work. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, been quite a journey. Yeah. So this is the Oh Hell No podcast. So it's time for you to share an Oh Hell No moment that has taught you something or um, changed your perspective on something. Uh, well, I've had a lot of those moments through, uh, <laughs> through my life. Um, well, professionally, I just told you, you know, I told you the one earlier when I first got introduced to it. But when I had that guy pay off right to the month that I told him, it was only three years into my into doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And that's when I went, oh my God, this really does work. Wow. <laughs> and so that, that really kind of, that's the one that penetrated my heart that just, I, that's when I really dug in. That's when I really knew I had something that it could literally change the financial trajectory of this country. Because yeah. based on 15 years, if, if this was widespread, I know 25% of the population would be debt-free, totally debt-free in five years. If yeah. this was Spread. And that's my goal. That's, wow. that's, my, that's my, my quest moving forward is that this will become a widespread known alternative to, to banking and borrowing. I love it. So tell everyone or tell us how we can connect with you um, and learn more about your program, your book, all of those things. Well, the best place to go is creditlinebanking.com. And again, we just launched that website, so it's brand new. So if you see anything, it's a little off. We're working on it. Uh, now, while you're there, you've got options. What I would really recommend is the, the um, Credit Line Banking Primer. I just recently wrote it. It's a 10-page document, and it'll, it'll break down exactly how and why this thing works. It doesn't have all the how to do it because you know, each program is customized. But if you want a real good view, real very basic third grade explanation, the primer is really good. Uh, from there, you can uh, also schedule a call on our calendar, schedule a free call with one, with me or one of my people. So, uh, you know, it's a free call and just learn more about how it works, why it works, if you're a good candidate or not. Uh, we can run some numbers and that's a, that's a real good place to start is just talk to a human and again, because every deal is customized, one size doesn't fit all for everybody. So if you take the time to talk to us, you know, we're real good and real quick at breaking it down and saying, you know, you're a good candidate, let's move to the next level, or you're not a good candidate, you might want to uh, fix a few things. So, so that's the best place to start is just credit line banking, start with the primer, schedule a call for us or with us, and uh, we'll see where the road takes us. So if someone is not a good candidate, um, do you guys offer like help on how they can um, get to their next level or what they might need to do? Maybe not even to become an, a candidate because maybe they're just not a good candidate for it ever. But do you guys offer anything like that that could help them? Well, we, we, we've got, we all have very, very varied backgrounds, right? And of course, this is the only service I provide. So if it comes down, you know, if, if we see an issue, we'll have a recommendation to remedy the problem. Okay. Whatever that might be, whether it be credit score, if you're, you know, your debt to income ratio, whatever, because we know what the banking world wants, right? From a mm -hmm. lendability standpoint. So if we see any problems there, we can provide remedies. Um, when it comes to being a good candidate or not, like you said, you know, we're going to be able to figure it out. You know, no, you're just not a good candidate. So keep doing what you're doing you know right do but we always try to help anybody that we're talking to yeah we can help them whether it benefits us or not we don't care we got a lot to offer and we just want people walking away with better people knowing us than not knowing us right and some knowledge as to how their finances are going all right well bill it was so nice talking with you today about this i learned a lot i really did not know i always saw home equity you know but i was just like okay well what is that but whatever but i really learned a lot reading um that chapter six and um it's quite interesting so um you know i wish you well and i'm sure that whoever contacts you will be better off for it. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Nicole. And uh, I'm going to say something real quick. Don't fear equity. Equity is your money. It's money yeah. in your house. And if you can access it and put it to work, 
put it to work. It's an asset. That house is an asset. Equity is within that house. Don't be scared of it. Use it. And thank you very much for the, the uh, privilege. I really, really appreciate it. And I'm grateful. Absolutely. And if you ever launch any new programs or anything else, please give me a call so you can come back on and tell us about it. Absolutely. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right.